Okay, so to recap, in previous videos we've looked at a number of examples uh, where evolution via sexual selection explains a number of interesting sorts of behaviors and traits. Males fighting with each other in non-lethal ways, males having territories, extreme traits, um, leading to sexual dimorphism where males and females are very different, males dancing, males looking like females, males and females actually changing sex during their lifetime, and then a number of other things. But sexual selection is only one aspect of selection. We want to continue our analysis of fitness and natural selection by thinking about what other types of selection are there. So this is actually a field uh, called life history theory. So far we've looked at sexual selection, but what about viability and fecundity selection, which we mentioned when we first introduced natural selection? So natural selection acts to maximize the total reproduction of an organism, because the ones with higher total reproduction pass on their genes more. And so it acts to increase the amount of time reproduction is possible as well. Longer lived organisms would reproduce more. So you would expect natural selection to also work on lifespan. So we can imagine some sort of plot like this, where the number of offspring per year that an individual has is positively related to their fitness. So fitness in evolutionary biology is often represented with a W for Sewell Wright, who's one of the people we talked about earlier in the course. So you have a positive relationship, you would expect, between the number of offspring per year and the fitness. And then, of course, if an organism lives longer, right, they have more years of having offspring, you would expect their fitness to go up. So these two different traits here both have a positive relationship with fitness. But if we think about, well, what sort of relationship do these traits have with one another? So if an organism reproduces for more years, how many offspring per year would we expect them to generate? So this is a fairly realistic hypothesis about that, what that relationship would be, right? The longer lived an organism is, you would expect them to have fewer offspring per year. Another way of thinking about this is, if an organism has fewer offspring per year, it would be able to live longer and reproduce for more years. If an organism had more offspring per year, maybe it wouldn't be able to keep that up for as long. So although each of these two traits has a positive relationship with fitness, they have a negative relationship with one another. If we think about natural selection increasing the number of years of having an offspring, you would expect that increase along this axis to result perhaps in a trade-off where there's fewer offspring per year. So this life history theory, which is the topic in this part of the course, examines trade-offs like this between survival and reproduction. Uh, here's an example of an experiment looking at this. This is an experiment from 1977 done by Snell and King. What they did was they collected rotifers. So this is what rotifers look like. Different species of rotifers are asexual or sexual. So what Snell and King did was they got a number of different clones of individuals, right? So they worked with the asexual species. They got a bunch of individuals who are genetically the same. So any differences they see between individuals are not going to be due to genetic differences, but are due to differences in maybe nutrition or different sorts of reproduction that they've done in the past. Uh, and you can actually measure reproduction pretty well because you can look at rotifers and you can see how many babies they're having, etc. So they set up these clones, they allowed reproduction, and then every 12 hours they checked for the survival of the individuals and they looked at the reproduction of those individuals. And this is going to allow them to actually look at this trade-off, or potential trade-off, between survival and reproduction. Here's one of the plots of their data. So this is fecundity at a certain age. So this is like the number of offspring they're having on average at a certain age, plotted against the probability of surviving. So an individual, what's the probability that they survive to the next 12-hour period? And then the line, you can see the negative relationship, right? So the more offspring an individual was having, the lower its chance was of surviving into the next time period, whereas the fewer offspring it was having, the higher its chance of surviving to the next time period. So in this experiment, you see a clear trade-off between essentially reproduction on this axis and lifespan on this axis. This is another set of data using slightly different variables. This is the same one, fecundity at a certain age. Over here, we have something called the reproductive value. So reproductive value is the expected number of offspring an individual will have in the future from its current age. So this does not take into account reproduction that has already occurred in the past. This only takes into account reproduction that will occur in the future. So the more offspring an individual is having in the present is causing them to end up having fewer offspring in the future. The fewer offspring they're having in the present is related to having more offspring in the future. 
So this reproductive value is actually a really important concept in thinking about evolution and natural selection because instead of thinking about reproduction now, it's the reproduction in the future which is more related to, say, total reproduction, which is more related to fitness. So if we think about reproductive value on this axis and we look at, say, humans, and we plot them from young to old, and we plot the reproductive value, so at the beginning, a newborn individual has some expected number of offspring that it will have in the future. As it gets older, this actually goes up, and take a couple seconds to think to yourself about why we expect the reproductive value to go up as an organism is living prior to actually doing any reproduction. So the reason this goes up is the expected number of offspring in the future here is lowered by the fact that these individuals might not survive to reproduce. But as they get older, their chances of surviving to reproduce are getting better and better and better. Once they get to puberty or sexual maturity and reproduction starts happening, then the reproductive value is going to go down because, say, these individuals here, although they may potentially reproduce in the future, they have already had some of their offspring in the past, so that reproductive value goes down, and then it finally goes down to zero once individuals are too old to reproduce or reach menopause or something like that. You can imagine that this sort of plot might actually look different for males and females within humans. The other thing that this plot is kind of highlighting is if we think about natural selection and what sorts of genes might be the most strongly favored or the least strongly favored, genes over here that maybe make these individuals better, well, their expected reproduction from that point on is pretty low, so you might not expect really strong selection on genes that have their effect then, versus maybe genes that have their effect then, when maybe the, a 10% increase or decrease would have the biggest bang for the buck, you might expect those genes to be most strongly selected. And we'll revisit this concept a little bit later in a more formal way. If we think about back to our rotifers and thinking about the reproductive value, both of those plots from the rotifers show there's kind of potentially two different strategies. If we plot number of organisms per unit time versus the age of an organism here, an individual may have more offspring per time, right? have higher reproduction per 12 hours, per year, whatever. But if it does that, it won't live as long, and so it will tend to die sooner versus other organisms where they have fewer offspring per time and they live longer. Per year they're having less, but they have it for more years. Which strategy generates the highest fitness? Well, you could figure this out in principle by integrating the area under the curve or something like this, right? Um, but for the purpose of this course, we'll kind of divide this into this kind of dichotomy that there's the sort of lots of reproduction and the organism doesn't live as long, or lower reproduction and the organism lives longer. And those are kind of two different strategies that organisms may evolve that cause them to have roughly equivalent fitness in this case. So we can see this kind of conflict between different aspects of fitness. If there's some sort of trait here that increases reproduction as the trait is larger, but that trait reduces survival as the trait is larger, and maybe this trait is something like number of offspring that they're having, when you combine these two and you plot the trait on this axis again, and then you have total fitness, which is a combination of reproduction and survival, you might expect to get some sort of relationship like this, where very low values of this trait have low fitness because they're not reproducing. Large values of the trait have low fitness because they're not surviving. And it's the intermediate values of this trait that end up generating the highest overall fitness for the organisms. And so this is another way of representing these conflicts or these trade-offs between different aspects of life history. And you've seen that figure um, when you were discussing stabilizing selection. So in stabilizing selection, if we plot the fitness here and the trait here, the peak is at some intermediate value of the trait. If we think about this plot here as the distribution of individuals in the population, so now this y-axis is like frequency of individuals, this x-axis is again the trait, the individuals in the gray portion are the ones who are going to do the best, right? Because they have the intermediate value of the trait, the highest fitness. So from the population as a whole, these individuals in the middle are the ones who tend to reproduce the most. So the mean of the trait isn't going to change much, right? That's where the average of the population is, the mean. After selection, the next generation, that's about the same. But you can imagine or you can envision that the variance would decrease, right? These individuals with very low values of the traits these individuals with the very high values of the traits are not reproducing, 
So the next generation, you would expect to have more kind of medium intermediate values of the trait. Now stabilizing selection can be caused by trade-offs we saw earlier, and it's one of three kind of basic types of natural selection that we often envision, figures like this. The second type is directional selection. So in directional selection, the bigger the trait, the higher the fitness. So if we were to envision, again, our population of individuals, the ones in the gray region reproduce more than the ones in the white, you would actually expect the mean of that population to increase, because right? these individuals reproduce more. So this whole distribution will shift to the right in this case. The variance would tend to stay pretty much the same, because although you're not ex selecting those extreme individuals, you are selecting extreme individuals here. And this diagram here is essentially what we thought about when we did our breeders equation earlier in the semester. Then the third type of selection, termed disruptive selection, in this case, individuals with low values of the trait, individuals with high values of the trait have the highest fitness, and intermediate individuals do most poorly. So in our population, these individuals do better, these individuals do better, the ones in the middle do worse. There's no real advantage to being bigger or smaller, so the mean would tend to stay the same after selection. But because extreme individuals are being selected, you'd expect that variance to increase and to spread out. So these different relationships between fitness and trait result in these different selections for individuals in the population, result in these changes in the mean and the variance of the trait over time. So if we think about different factors that can lead to these different patterns of selection, or we think about our directional selection, our stabilizing selection, our disruptive selection, what sorts of traits could we imagine would fit into these sorts of categories? So we can think about maybe examples that we've had from earlier in the semester, or examples you've heard about from other classes that you've taken, situations in which certain intermediate or extreme or extreme in both directions values of traits are advantageous. So here are just a few examples that I've come up with. So disease resistant, you can imagine being directional. So if you look at the VDJ system of genes in the immune system, there's a huge number of genes. So we seem to have underwent um, directional selection to increase the number of different antibodies we can produce. Or say speed, like cheetah and gazelle, evolving to be faster and faster and faster to escape from each other. Now, of course, directional selection, it's kind of unrealistic to imagine it lasting forever because you would tend to run into limits, like there are too many loci for the immune system, or organisms are getting so fast that their legs are thin and become fragile and they break their legs more often. Although this often can be envisioned the short term, you might often expect that to run into stabilizing selection, where, for example, being faster is better, but you break your legs more, so there ends up being kind of an optimal zone of speed or number of loci in the immune system. So stabilizing selection, the most famous example that's best studied is actually in humans, newborn birth weight is apparently under very strong stabilizing selection. Very, very large babies increase the risk of injury to the mother and have poorer outcomes at birth than intermediate sized babies who themselves do better than very small babies who come out underdeveloped. So within humans, if we plot birth weight, there seems to be stabilizing selection. You can imagine aspects of male morphology, like those long tails that we saw in the birds are under the same sort of process. Too short and the females don't mate with the male. Too long and the male can't fly, so can't escape from predators or find food. And then for disruptive selection, where the small and the large but not the intermediate are optimum, one example comes from clams. So in the Pacific Northwest, there are clams that when they're small, they can kind of hide in the nooks and crannies of the rocky shore and hide from starfish, who are their main predators. And when they're very big, the starfish can't reach all the way around the clam to kind of pull them open. In intermediate sizes, they're not small enough to hide in the, in the rocks, but they are small enough for the starfish to be able to reach around and open them up. So it's this intermediate size of clams that do most poorly under starfish predation. And then you can imagine a number of different behaviors maybe work like this too, where maybe being aggressive might get you territories, whereas the other end of the spectrum, maybe these are the individuals who are the sneaker males, and maybe the intermediate individuals here who are kind of half-heartedly trying to get territories and never really trying to sneak, maybe that sort of behavior would not be nearly as good as one of these two kind of more extreme options over here. So in this life history theory part of the course, we'll be thinking about these types of selection and thinking about all the different factors that can lead to those types of selection and thinking about fitness in a more sophisticated way.
Life history theory is the study of organism lifestyles, evolutionary survival and reproduction strategies. It's complex because it's caused by these trade-offs. Life history theory is a major part of ecology because many of these strategies are environment dependent. So when you take an ecology class, life history theory is often a major part of that. In this course, we'll study four aspects of this. We'll study why organisms die, whether organisms should reproduce once or often. We'll look at optimal clutch size, the number of organisms that is optimal to have. And then we'll actually then look at conflicts in optimal strategies between different individuals.